All right. Thank you for letting me know. All right. And start recording. All right. You got it. Ooh, okay. Thanks for helping out, everybody. Um, you've got your uh, big... Uh, You've got your big daddy vector space V. This is this is the space you're living in. For the R3 supremacists out there, you can think about R3, you can continue thinking about R3, but it's just some kind of vector space, um, not necessarily for R3. And you've got some set of vectors in your hand. Think about this as being just a small set of vectors, just a handful, one, two, three, four, something like that. Um, the set of S is called a spanning set. So your, your, the, the set of vectors in your hand, this, this little collection of vectors you have, gets a special name. It's a spanning set for V, the vector space, when the span of those vectors, that is all the things you can cook up using different linear combinations of your vectors, because, is actually the space V. So it's a spanning set for V is what is, is um, means you can cook up the whole space V. In other words, you take any element of V and it's in the span of S. For example, is this set of vectors, v1, v2, v3, v4, being this uh, this lovely set of vectors here, the ones that are in your hand, imagine you've got four vectors in your hand. Is this a spanning set for your, uh, your vector space R3? Is it a spanning set? So equi equivalently, does any element B from R3 belong to the span? Does any element B from R3 belong to the span? Probably. YouTube stream broke. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you can hear me. There's plenty of room in Blackboard Collaborate if, if you can't see it on YouTube. Let's get back to this. Um, so suppose, suppose B being any old element of from R3, so B1, B2, B3 is in the span of S, then there, well, then B is a That is lambda one. So when you say when something is in the span, it is a linear combination of the vectors from S, and that is to say it's it can it has this shape. It has the shape one two three plus lambda two minus one one zero plus lambda three two minus one one plus lambda four three three eight equals b1 b2 b3 it has this shape uh, for some uh lambda one lambda mm, lambda two lambda three in the real numbers it has that shape okay uh so this is really just the kind of thing you would solve with a system of linear equations Uh, and lambda four, what about four? No, lambda four is right here. Oh, and lambda four, yes, of course, lambda four, thank you. Four, squeeze that in. Solve, maybe say, uh, yeah, let's say solve. Now we already know that this thing is going to have solutions. That's what we've that's what we assumed. We've assumed the B is in the span. We assumed the B was in the span, which means we are assuming this thing is going to have solutions, just like in the previous question. One question, why was voice chat disabled again? Is disabled by voice chat. Voice chat's always disabled. It's only it's because only I would get to talk. I have uh, I have that power. You can chat. Um, I think voice chat's always disabled. For these uh, like large lectures, 
solve with an augmented matrix. One, two, three, minus one, one, zero. Um, and we're expecting this thing to have solutions. So I'm going to do some uh, real operations on this bad boy. That's going to be zero, three, one, one minus six is minus five, eight minus nine, B three minus three B one. And I'll sneak in row two. Zero, uh, that's gonna be one minus minus uh, minus minus three, oh, one minus minus two, which is three, minus one minus four is minus five, three minus three minus six is minus three. B two minus two, B one. And then I'll do row three, sorry, bro. yeah, row three is row three minus row two. And I'll get one, Zero, three, minus five, minus three. Zero, 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 two. And this will be B3 minus B2. And I've got minus three B3 and I'll add two B1. Uh, minus three B1 and I'll add two B1s so gives me minus B1. Ah, behold, row echelon form of my matrix. Leading term, leading term, leading term. Of course, we assumed that this was going to have solutions. This has solutions. No Nobel Prize for you for determining that. You assumed it had solutions. Of course, it was going to have solutions. The important thing is it has solutions regardless So unlike our previous example, this question or this set of vectors has solutions regardless of the values of B. Remember in the previous uh, question, we, we looked at a similar example and we found there were some conditions on B. We assumed that B was in the span as, as we, uh, just as we did up here and we discovered that, hang on a second, there's, there's conditions on that. That assumption has consequences. This time we assumed the same thing, no consequences. B's always in the span. B's always in the span. Hence, is in span. Hence, every value of B can be expressed as star, and three <laughs> and belongs to span. What's the difference between the last question and this one? Rather, the last question we did, we started off exactly the same way. We started off by assuming that B was in the span. And then we and then we solved an equation, and we just and we knew this thing had to have solutions, but there there had to be some conditions on these on this term over here. So when we row reduced, we discovered that this thing had to be zero, and that introduced restrictions on B. Our assumption that B was in the span had uh, had consequences on the values of B. This time, different set of vectors. We assume B is in the span. Turns out there's no restrictions on B. In fact, 
any value of B you can think of is going to be in this span, expressible uh, as a linear combination of the vectors from S like this. How long is the lecture recording gets uploaded straight away? Does it have to have solutions regardless because two of the lambda fours can be anything? No, it's because it's because um, all the it's because this column here is never leading. That's what means it has uh, solutions regardless of the value of b. Uh, so is a spanning set because any element of B, Jonathan, you are spot on there. Any element of B is in R3. That's what makes it a spanning set. So the span of S covers R3, if you like. What's the thing? What is the thing after can be expressed as? Can be expressed as star. So that's my, I've labeled this equation star. That's just this symbol up here. Um, does this arise from the fact that we have at least par three parallel vectors? No, no. It's to do with the. Uh, it's to do with the. I'm not sure what you mean by three parallel vectors. I don't see the parallel vectors here. Um, could we also prove this by picking three of the vectors and proving that they are linearly independent? Lewis, you are you are stepping about three or four lectures ahead. Um, that's my dog. Uh, three or four lectures ahead of uh, of where we are right now. We have not introduced linear independence, although we'll get there. Could I see a solution from the previous question for a second? Um, uh, I don't think I saved. Oh, wait, I did save it. Yay. Here, here, this one. So here we made the same assumption. Damn, my handwriting's bad. We supposed B was in the span. And then we solved this equation here. Oh, but that, that meant this equation has solutions. And in order to ensure that this thing does have solutions, this thing had to be zero. No, my cat and dog love each other. Um, they're, they're awesome together. Um, <laughs> does this arise from the fact that we have three non-parallel vectors in the same way that two non... Kind of, Samuel, you're getting onto, the, um, you're getting onto this idea. We need, we need one more concept to make that really clarified. Um, and, and we'll get to there this lecture. Okay, so let's uh, let's just. Uh, I think I think we're okay. Chicken and Charlotte collab. Um, <laughs> okay, let's get back onto this. Note that this system, this system of equations here, would have had would still have a solution if we deleted the non-leading column three. So this is column three here, this one, we never we don't we don't need that. We totally don't need that. In fact, if I go back to the question and I just scrub out V3, I just scrub that out, I scrub that out, and I just pretend like uh, I pretend like column three never existed. Like, yeah, there you go. There was no column three. There was just, it never existed. Um, yes, because it's not leading. Um, and it doesn't change the, the the result of this analysis. The whole question say stays exactly the same. B is still in the span regardless of its value. So the set S without V3, so the set V1, V2, V4 is still a spanning set. Both of them, as, yep, we don't, we don't need V3. So both of these things, this one, this one here, V1, V2, V3, V4, and this one here, V1, V2, V4, are both spanning sets from R, of R3. So we can only care about it if it has a solution or not. Right, I'm not sure what you what that means. So we only care about it if it has a solution or not. Um, and, oh, sorry, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, for spanning sets, that's exactly right. You don't care how many solutions? No, no, no. You only care that it has a solution. That was the only assumption you made. You assumed it had a solution. Not. It, I assume it has lots of solutions. Okay. Um, does it mean you can express V3 as a linear combination of the others? Yes, that is true, but not relevant. <laughs> Do not cloud the issue with facts. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Something, okay. Um, uh, we can note that if you include V3, then you obtain infinitely many solutions. And if you delete it, then the system has a unique solution. That might, that's gonna become important later. So that's the kind of nature of, uh, of the what, what you were getting on before uh, 
uh, Christopher, where I said that was irrelevant. Um, it's irrelevant now. It becomes relevant later. So I, I shouldn't have been so harsh on you. Um, so let's let's just. I guess the the only other thing I want to say about this is, in some sense, the in in the sense that we've uh, for spans, the vector v three is redundant. You don't need it. The same the things you can cook up with v one, v two, v three, v four are the same as v one, v two, and v four. So if you if you it's like you have a shopping list and your shopping list has v one, v two, v three, v four written on it, and you you take the list and you're like, hang on a second, I don't need to buy v three. V three I can construct already out of my v one, v two, v four. It's uh it doesn't doesn't add anything to the things I can cook. So you would never bother taking v three with you. It's redundant. You would uh, you would chop that out and produce a, a kind of a better shopping list. So in some sense, we want this one to be better. Uh, because it has no V3 in it. Uh, don't get what David said about the rightmost column. All right. Uh, what did David say? As long as the rightmost column is not uh, is non-leading. Yeah. So David David's talking about the conditions on um, on whether there to be solutions. So we we assume this thing has solutions. We assume this equation has solutions, and it's going to have solutions provided this thing is non-leading. Nicholas says, if I don't need chicken stock, if I buy a whole chicken and a bone, yes, exactly, Nicholas, one HD for you, my friend. That's exactly, yes, well done. You, ro you rolled with the analogy. All right. Let's, uh, what does the spanning set necessarily mean? It means, um, it means, well, Anna, if you know what a linear combination is, linear combination is a, an expression like this. So you take a, you take a vector, Maybe I'll go to one that I haven't crossed out um, like this. An expression like this is a linear combination of uh, v one, uh, 1, 2, 0, and 3, minus 2, minus 1. You just make, you, and given any set, you can throw them together by taking uh, some scalar, uh, lambda 1 times your first vector, plus lambda 2 times the second vector, and, and lambda 3 times your third vector, and so on, until you've gone, all, gone through all your vectors. And any expression like that is called a linear combination of the vectors. And sometimes, and the, the question we're typically asking is, given a vector, can you express it as a linear combination? And that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that you would then go and solve with a a um, augmented matrix. And a span is just all linear combinations. So, if something's in the span, if it has this shape has the shape of a linear combination. All right, column space. So problems about spans inevitably read, uh, we've seen that problems about span of a set of vectors leads to writing those vectors as the columns of a matrix. Audio is cutting out for you. Uh, is that is anyone else having audio troubles? I can switch microphones if that's, Nope. Okay. Cool. Uh, I'll just keep going then. Um, we're going to start talking about the column space of a matrix, as the um, as the as literally the span of the columns of A. What we're getting at here is we're starting to, is we're, what eventually we're going to start doing is thinking about this as being the um, the image of a matrix. But let's maybe, maybe we don't get. Maybe we won't go there just yet. The so the column space of A. Actually, we can go there. That's all right. If you think about A, A, taking in vectors from say, uh, it's an n by m matrix. I mean, it's, it's, so you think about a, a, a matrix as a. Maybe, maybe I'll write it up here. So A is a matrix with, say, M uh, coles. So da, 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 M of those and N rows. If you think about a matrix as having a certain number of columns and a certain number of rows, then you can think about the matrix A as, map, as taking 
n vectors of size m. So it will it will work on vectors of size m. Sorry, you will, so by through matrix multiplication, and it will output vectors of size n. So it defines a function as a x equals b. Or maybe, maybe I'll just say as yeah a mm, x. Your input vector x gets mapped to a x. So an x from R m goes to R m goes to R n. So a matrix is really a transformation about of a vector space. You have a m an m dimensional space, and you can bust a matrix on that and transform your space into an R an n dimensional space through matrix multiplication. Are the rows and columns swapped? Uh, no. Nope. This has got M columns and N rows and it will input. Yeah, when you when you apply the matrix to a vector, it has to be a, it has to have M, M of those things. So that, that number has to match. So I'll do that in blue. Now the column space, so so just to have an analogy, this would be the domain here, and this would be the range. Sorry, codomain. Just to use the analogy of uh, of vectors. Um, sorry, was this? Think of think of the close your eyes for a moment and think of a matrix as a function. Think about think about a calculus. Think about a function, but instead of being from R to R, it's from m dimensional space to n dimensional space. Now I'm going to invoke those concepts that are familiar to you from calculus. You have the space R m, which is the domain. Those are the things you feed into your matrix through matrix multiplication. It will produce vectors from R n. Does m mean M is the, does the M dimensions mean M columns? Yes, that's exactly what it means. I'm talking about the shape of the matrix over here. It's uh, It's got M columns and it's got N rows to it. So coming back to our, our calculus, let's just breathe, close your eyes, put your hands together, get comfortable, get your yoga mat out, think about the matrix as being a function as you would calculus. We've got a domain, vectors from Rm. These are the things you feed into your matrix. It produces vectors in Rn just because of the shape of the matrix. Matrices of different shapes take in different, different size vectors and produce different size vectors. The space Rn is your codomain. Is it, is it, you could do linear algebra A M S R A S M R. I don't know what it is. The space R. Thank you. Yes. Um, the space R N is your codomain. But now things are going, going to get freaky because I want to talk about the range of your your matrix. The range of your matrix is the things that it actually maps to inside R N. Yeah, you with me? So it's just like domain and range. Sorry, co codomain and range of a function from calculus. You, your matrix maps into a space, Rn. It produces vectors of a particular size. But the things it actually maps to, things it actually maps to is the range of the matrix. But in calculus land, we call that the column space. And that's what we're talking about here. So that was a bit longer than I intended to spend on this, but I think it's worthwhile drawing that analogy um, with calculus. Um, literally, the, the column space is totally easy to find. The range of a function is uh, the range of a matrix, totally easy to find. It's unlike calculus, where ranges can sometimes be uh, difficult. Uh, so the codomain is the dimension of the space and the range is the column space. Kai, you are spot on. HD for you, my friend. You, that's it. What he said. You can teach the class from now on. That's exactly what I, that's where I'm going. 
Um, now, unlike calculus, the column space or range of a matrix is dead set easy to find. It's literally the span of the columns, the span of the vectors whose columns are A. You just take the you just take your matrix and you take its columns as a span. Um, uh, so let's talk about this matrix here. Determine whether or not this vector B is in the column space of A. Let's just talk about yeah, Kai's. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's just talk about this matrix and what it's doing to the space for a moment. A takes in vectors from R3 and produces vectors of shape. Just talk about the shape. You're not, not even doing any, any analysis, no row reduction for a moment. It takes in vectors of R3. We just imagine when you multiply this thing by an X1, X2, X3. Well, if you, yeah, imagine, imagine what happens if you take AX. You have to multiply this, you have to, the, the shape of the vector has to be R3. And what you produce is a vector from R4, like B. So we might sort, we might say domain, domain of A is R3, range, a uh, codomain of A is R4, just because it, it will produce vectors of size well, with four entries in it. And the range of A is going to be the column space. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So you're going to feed in things of, uh, feed in things of um, like a three-dimensional vector space like this. So here's X2, X1, X3. And through the matrix A, that's going to be transformed into a four-dimensional vector space I'm just going to draw it in, pointing in, in freaky ways. X1, X2, I'll call, it B, I'll call them Bs. B1, B2, B3, and B4. They point in four different directions, just imagine. Um, but it's not going to necessarily map to all of this space. Maybe it just maps into, maybe it just maps into these two directions here and never into the other directions. Well, we have to determine this. So this red, this red thing here, this subspace, it's going to be a. This is going to be the column space of A. So it's not necessarily going to map into all of R four. Mapping the same as spanning. Uh, so what's getting mapped? All of R three. All of R three is getting crammed down into whatever that 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 column space is by the matrix A. It's, it takes all of R3 and mushes it into R4. And uh, what you'll end up with is either going to be something that looks like R3 or it could mush it into a plane or it could mush it into a line. And if your matrix is all zeros, it's going to mush the whole space R3 to a single point zero. Let's, um, so I, it's effectively like applying the function as we've been saying. Yes, that, yep. Um, it's a special kind of function. We're going to see some, it has, it has beautiful properties that make um, algebra just, just absolutely lovely to work with. Anyway, sorry. What we're, all, we're, all we're asking is, is, it, is it this particular B? We want to know, is the B, is this B in here or is it in here in the space that doesn't get mapped to? We, we need to we need to know so where is the actual b is it in the in the column space or not okay so b is in the column of uh, the column space of a when So hopefully this is uh, this is just like uh, just uh, it, yeah I won't, I won't I won't write it but I'll just say it's just like um, a, the kind of question you would ask about uh, 
is this is this a number in the range of a function? You're trying to establish that this thing exists uh, given the b. Does is there some input that makes the function map to b? Of course, we solve this. Uh, Would it mean? Would it mean if A was not? What would it mean if A was not invertible? Um, I don't want to answer that question just yet. It's a good question. I'm gonna. But, but when? But, but we're not ready. We're not ready for that. <laughs> Excellent question, though. Love it. Lose Kai. You can lose some sleep over that, and uh, and and I I would I want you to you know, think about that. So one. Minus one, two, three. Two, minus two. Two. And I'll do some row reduction. Row. Zero, seven, seventeen plus three is twenty. One minus four and eleven minus minus two is thirteen. And zero, one, zero, two. And I can do some stuff here. Uh, zero, zero, sorry, not that one. Oh no, I did the one, uh, five, uh, two, zero, zero, minus three, three, and row four is row four minus seven, row two, zero, 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 minus six, uh, 20 minus 14 is 6. And finally, row 4. Mm -hmm. uh, have I done something wrong? Domain is R3 because there are three columns, yes. Um, Zero. I might even sneak in a row three is row three over minus three. Zero one minus one. Zero 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 zero. Let us pause to appreciate row echelon form. It's almost even reduced row echelon form, which I like. Actually, I will. I'm going to go all the way to reduced row echelon form, even though it's not strictly necessary. I think there's some nutritional value in that. Uh, row one is row one minus two, row three, one, zero, two, one, zero, zero. All the vitamin, vitamins and minerals of an X of a, uh, reduced row echelon form. Um, so that's two, but minus one plus two is one. Ah, uh, yeah.
Leading term, yeah. leading term, leading term. Uh, yeah, that's my divided by. Um, this is reduced row echelon form. It tells me, it tells me, hence B is in column, uh, B is, uh, hence X. Uh, in fact, I can even tell you what X is. X is uh, one, two, minus one. Such that A X equals B. I E B is in the range. You can call it range if you want, but I'm going to call it column space. Uh, R3 is R3 minus R1. Uh, is, have, I, have I done something wrong? Uh, let me verify that this is actually correct. I don't think I've done something wrong. Let me just check. Uh, I've said that's... So verify. It's really easy to verify these calculations, by the way. Plus two. Is it a small typo? The numbers are right there. Okay, I'm look. I'm going to verify it anyway. Uh, zero one five seven minus two minus two one zero is equal to one plus nothing minus two is minus one minus one plus two is one plus two is three two plus ten is twelve minus one minus one twelve minus one is eleven yeah yeah i'm good three plus fourteen is 14 minus zero, hang on, three plus 14 is 17, is B. After R4 is R4 minus, uh, it's supposed to be, after R4 is R4, it's supposed to be R2 is R2 minus, R2 minus 2R1. Isn't that what I did? Oh, R oh, 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 R three. Sorry. There you go. Thank you, everybody. I know you've been telling me that for a while. Um, a, is the is a x? So Damien says, is a x equals b line required, or can we just say therefore there is a solution? Um, be be kind to the person who's reading it, Damien. Just be aware of who you're writing to and whether or not you would, they would want to see something like that. Uh, so it's a, it's a style, it's a question of style. Would you want to write that in? Would you not? I'm choosing to write it in because I'm pushing this very kind of, kind of calculus agenda here about thinking about this thing as a, uh, as a function. Do we, after we solve that row echelon form and get a solution in, okay. Uh, after we solve that row echelon form and get a solution, then B will be in the column space, right? That's exactly right. Because the matrix says so. The matrix, this matrix here says this column is not leading. And hence there, and hence there is a solution. We went a little bit, we went, a, we could have stopped over here. We went a little bit further and actually said what the X was. Uh, Dimitri's question, why is our answer X in R3 when the vector B is in R4? I'm so glad you asked that question. The function A is a function mapping from R3 to R4. So X is the input, X is from the domain, and B is from the codomain. So X, unlike unlike uh, your your one variable calculus or your, your your calculus course, your X and your the the input and output actually have different shapes here, depending on what the shape of your matrix is. Uh, like when you multiply matrices together. Yeah, I mean that's what you're doing essentially. You're you're you you get uh yeah exactly no that's exactly right. Um, you feed in something and what you get out again is a different shape depending on uh, the size of your matrix. 
Could the codomain be R3 since the last row was all nine? I don't see a row with all nines in it. All zero. No, 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 that's, no, it's not determined by the row reduction. It's determined entirely by the, um, the shape, this shape here of your matrix. It's this, it's this, yeah, you, you know what this, you know what space it is just by looking at this and how many rows and columns it's got, not by its row reduction. All right. All right. Whew. Okay. Okay. So much to say. Um, so little time. Let's uh, let's let's just let's keep going. So, if you consider a matrix as a function between vector spaces, which is what we've been doing here, then the domain is V one, the codomain is V two, and the range is column space of A. Yep. And incidentally, because we're talking about matrices, the column space, the column space, column space. I'll remind you is column space of A which I want you to think about as being the range of A, uh, literally means span of the columns of A. Hang on, what happens if you solve it and there's no solutions? Uh, then in that case, if we go back up here, then, I mean, column space is just a subspace of the uh, of the codomain. And it's not always going to be the case that your range is your codomain. So your sum, uh, we, so yeah, it's just the, yeah, that's all, that's all I want to say. That's it. Huh, okay. Observe that when we multiply, okay, so this is, this is nice. This is, perhaps explains to you why we think, we, why we talk about it as a span of columns. Observe that when you take a matrix and you multiply it by a vector, confusingly, I've called it B here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I want to answer the question about differences between infinite solutions and one solutions in this chapter. <laughs> um, so just hold on to that question. Hold on to that confess question. Just to confirm column space is a subspace of codomain. Absolutely, Annika, HD for you, yes. To be, uh, to, we could even be more precise and say the column space is the span of the columns, and spans are always subspaces. So um, there you go. If the codomain was of a lower dimension, then did oh, you're now now you're getting that's like three or four uh, lectures from here. I'm glad to see you're thinking about this. Keep thinking about it. We'll get there. But yes, you're on, you're definitely on the right track with that prior. Nice one. Um, Observe that when we multiply, you can have a HD as well. <laughs> when we multiply a matrix by a vector, can I, I'm just going to change these to Xs just to be consistent with what I did before. Uh, when we multiply a matrix, A, let's call it matrix A, by a vector X, uh, so that's X1, X2 up to Xn, um, then that produces a linear combination of the columns of the matrix, literally, a times if so if so if you've got a matrix A and the matrix A is made up of columns V1 and then another column V2 and then another column V3 and so on all the way up to Vn. So I'm just I'm just naming the columns here. These are the columns. Then when you multiply A by the vector x, what you actually end up with is x1 times the first column plus x2 times the second column plus xn times the second column. And it's it's this, uh, this kind of operation of matrix multiplication, which is why if we take s as the set of columns of the matrix, then taking a matrix times by any vector from the domain is automatically automatically a linear combination.
Yep, you, absolutely. You can think about that as as it's a very functional kind of approach to matrices. But yes, you can think about it that way. It, to be precise, Alex, is, is what matrix multiplication is. Yeah. Um. So it's yeah. So matrix multiplication is and has been all along just linear combinations of the columns of the matrix. Um. So we can now add to our list of things. We talked we talked about spans and we generally want to know you give you have a set of you have a set of elements, a set of vectors in your hand. And it's a good place to wrap up the lecture. You have a we started off two lectures ago having a set of vectors in your hand called S. And we are we asked questions about whether or not U was in the span of S. And that literally means U is a linear combination of the elements of S, but we've just seen linear combinations and matrices go real well together. In fact, you just take all those columns, those vectors, and you, you squish them together as a matrix, and essentially all, all your question about U being in the span boils down to can you solve this equation? Can you solve that matrix equation? Which is why all along we've been solving these equations using matrices. And this is just a, this is, this is, it, this is it, identical to number one. The codomain is the domain. Uh, so what is the difference between codomain and range? Codomain is just the um, size of the space it maps into. And as Kai is, Kai, you know what? You just teach the course, mate. Um, um, you're, doing a, you're doing a great job. <laughs> what he said. All right. Um, that's it for today's lecture. We have, uh, we have, um, yeah, can we get hearts in chat for Kai, who's now taking over as algebra lecturer? I, I will retire at this point. <laughs> um, next lecture will be the linear independence chapter. And I know there's a lot of people getting on to, um, to where this is going. Um, and we'll get there. We'll get there on Monday. Um, before we do that, we need to talk about the winners of this week's challenge and... Um, and announce the new challenge. So I need to share with you a different screen. What have I got here? Uh, da -da. Okay, here we go. Uh, so I stop sharing that one and start sharing da -da 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 -da. that one. Okay. Cool. So here are some of the entries from this week's challenge. The challenge was to answer a question entirely with pictures. No words were permitted. Um, this question is from Wen Yi, and he's this, what he proved is that the shortest distance from P to Q, uh, sorry, the shortest distance from P to the line L1, then from the line L1 to L2, and then the line L2 to Q, is these perpendicular distances? Uh, so, and I think that's just—I think that's just lovely. I love how he's used the the right triangles here to indicate the position of the um, of the right angles. What else have we got? We've got this one, Henry Hutchinson, and this one's dedicated to David Angel, uh, who's teaching discrete mathematics, and uh, his rigorous proof by Venn diagrams, which I thoroughly approve of. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Um, I, in this one included a hashtag, which I thought was cute, technically not okay because it's words, but, um, but still very nice. Uh, this one, this one made me laugh. Um, the, <laughs> um, this one, who, who sent in this one? Let me just check. Da, 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 da. Uh, Miguel, Miguel sent this one in, which uh, which is awesome. Uh, this one, that's my one. Never disregard that. This one, I love this one. This one is a proof that the x plus y all squared is x squared plus y squared plus two x y. Uh, sent in, um, sent in anonymously. Uh, I like this one because that's exactly how the Babylonians would have thought about things. It's a very kind of geometric, physical expression. They wouldn't have used X's and Y's, of course. They would have used numbers. They didn't believe in these things, these, these, this witchcraft like X and Y. Uh, okay, no worries, Marcus. See you later. Um, but the winner, I have to give the winner to, to, and do I have any more in this folder? No, nope, that's it. I have to give the winner to 
Ah, 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 just leave your suspense there for a moment longer. Uh, oh, what's happened to what's happened to this thing? Oh no. Yes, I did get a haircut. Thank you for noticing. Uh, oh no, it's not representing properly. Oh no, I'll have to post. Mm. I know. I'm, <laughs> it's um. Hang on, I know what to do. I know what to do. Da, 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 da. Yes, here we go. Here we go. So I have to share with you this screen. Um, sorry, it's not. It's not. Uh, didn't open properly in this thing. So recursion infinite. Here we go. Here we go. So this one. Hopefully you can see this now. Um, so Daniel Tupper sent me this one, and I thought, uh, you know, he went all out. I love how he embraced the challenge here. So you, you're just you're just here walking along. Can you see what I'm doing here? Yes, you can. Sorry about the recursion. You, you're walking along. Someone's got a set, and they throw you the set, and you look surprised. And then you're told to show that it's a subspace and you look even more surprised. Here is the set and the answer is some zeros. Minus zero plus zero is not equal to three. And uh, and then I'm not sure how trade deals work into it. But what I love about this one, and this is why Daniel's getting the, the mug this week, is he's taken the challenge and not only has he written the question as all pitches, <laughs> And the answer, uh, but he worked in um, actual content from the lectures and ac actually something I said in lectures, which made me feel good because at least I know someone was listening and that made me happy. But no, it's, it's really, I love his dedication to the challenge here. So well done. Uh, well done, Daniel. You get to, you get a mug back when, uh, when things finally uh, settle down. <sighs> all right. All right. Um, the challenge for next week. Uh, Daniel, Daniel <laughs> the challenge for next week, and I'll put up a post on um, on Moodle about this. The, hey, Jay, you can take over in a minute. I just got to announce next week's challenge. Um, the challenge for next week is to uh, is essentially to update the poem about two scribes um, uh, dissing on each other. So it's you have to make a rhyming poetical dialogue between two math one two three one students there's an older math one two three one student a younger math one two three one three one student or a kind of superior one and an inferior one and the older one has to say in math one two three one rhyming terms why the younger one is no good at math one two three one um so it's essentially epic rap battle about uh about uh, math one two three one i'll put it a post about this in moodle send me your entries by thursday and uh, the winning entry gets a mug. Um, all righty. Next one should be a fairy tale. Happy to take requests. All right, all right. Um, Jaya, uh, oh, can we read them on stream? Uh, I, I, oh, maybe. I'll think about that. I'll have to figure out how to make that work. Um, Jaya, over to you. Yeah, no worries, guys. Hey, there we go. I'll uh, turn off my mic.
Jaya, can you turn on your microphone? Uh, I still can't. Hi, Jay. I'm here. Hey, it's working. Oh, wait, that's Mark. That's Mark. Yes. Daniel, which chat do you monitor? Do you monitor the Blackboard Collaborate or the Moodle chat? Or which? The Blackboard Collaborate. I can forget about the other. Yeah, uh, forget about the other. Um, I know there's people watching on YouTube, um, but I'm. Uh, if you guys can hear me, I'm going to start getting you guys to just join in on the Blackboard Collaborate chat from now on so I don't have to set up two streams for um, every lecture and, and monitor two chats. So are we, um, uh, Jaya, your, your microphone appears to not be working. Um, dare I suggest you do the, the, uh, age old trick of turning it, turning your computer off and on again. I'm not, I have no idea why it wouldn't be working. I mean, it seems like your microphone's turned on. So I'm, I'm pretty much out of ideas other than that one, which does, uh, oh, connect connect audio with phone. I'm not sure. We could we could try that one. I, his audio should work. I mean, it was working in the previous lecture. So, and look, as as frustrating as it is, turning your computer off and on again does solve about ninety percent of IT troubles. So you reckon change device. Um, uh, Jay, can you click the cog? The little, oh, I can hear a little bit. I can, I can hear it a little bit, yes. Why would I only be able to hear it a little bit though? Uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, the, the microphones the microphones plugged into the document camera the mo microphones actually part of the document camera um hmm. whoops i'm not looking at the chat there's time for everyone to get a mac <laughs> Hasn't been allowed in the browser. Could be. Yeah, could be. Daniel, are you going to be here for the hour? Or how uh, I will be. Um, I'm still. I'm streaming this session onto YouTube as well, so I pretty much have to be here. 
um, for this hour, but I'm going to stop doing that as of next week because it seems like everyone can. Uh, there's enough people who watch it live that they can all fit on the um, the Blackboard Collaborate server, uh, Blackboard Collaborate stream, and I I don't really have to have an overflow stream from um from this week onwards. <sighs> so yeah, I'll stick around for this one. And are you teaching, Mark, are you teaching um, the next chapter of the course? Is that right? Um, very likely. Uh, I, I want to see just how chaotic this is going to be first. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. YouTube is better because you can rewind mid-lecture. Um, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, so you guys reckon I should keep going with the YouTube, uh, the YouTube one as well, but I don't want, I can't monitor two chats. <laughs> I'm a, I'm at a hundred percent capacity with just one chat and the lectures. Um, but if you, I mean, if there's enough demand to keep going, the, um, just ignore YouTube chat, tell you what, let's, uh, let me do this. Oh no, I, it, look, if there's enough demand out there and you want me to keep running the YouTube version of the chat uh, version of this, then I can, I can do that. Um, Hey, turn YouTube chat off. I mean, I don't mind people just talking to each other just so long as they don't expect me to monitor two chats. Okay, I'm going to turn my microphone off. Lovely infinity. Whoops, my mic. So, uh, it should be working now, Mark. Hey, yep. yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> Reloading. Yes. Uh, okay. Can't see your screen anymore, though. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, let's see. Let's share the screen. Hopefully, we won't get just one or the other. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. Uh, okay. So you can see the. Slides as well, right, Mark? Yeah. All right. We're good. Uh, all right, it's good. So, time to time. Um, let me, uh, students, let me introduce, before I start the session, let me introduce uh, Professor Mark um, Holster here. Uh, he is online with us. Um, he will be uh, here monitoring the chat and uh, uh, we help us to answer any questions if I miss and so on. And uh, so he will be here throughout this uh, this topic on trigonometric integrals. Then uh, he will start thinking on the next topic, ordinary differential equation. And I'll be available online for monitoring the chat and help you with the question and so on. So this is how you're going to go from uh, uh, now. Okay, so we both of us will be on online during calculus uh, lectures um, on different roles, uh, depending on which topic we are uh, we are covering. Okay, all right. Um, so yes, uh, it will be good. Uh, so the topic uh, we'll be focusing on today is on um, trigonometric integrals. So the we focus specifically on integrals involving trigonometry functions, so the fu integrals of this type, uh, cosine uh, for mx, times sine nx, 
uh, dx or so m can be an odd number or even number and, and same as n as well. Now the question is why do we uh, want to look at specifically on uh, trigonometric uh, integrals? The next slide uh, we give you an answer. Now, many problems in three-dimensional space request spherical polar coordinates. Now, don't worry about the spherical polar coordinates. Spherical, spherical polar coordinates uh, is not part of the map 1231 uh, syllabus. Okay? Uh, uh, the spherical coordinate system and the applications are taught in second year engineering mathematics courses and so on. Now, in, uh, in three dimensional space, uh, a point can be represented by the distance from the origin. If you look at the diagram here, uh, so here, the distance, so this is the point P, can be represented by the distance from the origin R and the angle it makes, the OP makes with the square axis, that's part here. And then we project P to the XY plane, and then you have the uh, distance from the Y axis, X, uh, X coordinate and the Y coordinate like that. That gives you, so if you calculate that, let me show you, even though it is uh, not part of the, so that's here, if you draw a line like this, uh, it's perpendicular there. So that is R. So this one on the on the triangle OP, let's put M here. OPM, this is R cosine phi. Right? So this one is R sine phi. Okay. Now, so that means this is R sine phi here. So that is R sine phi. So this angle is theta. So this project in of the point P on the XY plane it makes an angle here in this line. Let me call that N. O n makes an angle theta from the x-axis. So this gives you r sine phi, this one, r sine phi cosine theta. So that's the distance from uh, x. So x equals r sine phi cosine theta here. Okay. Similarly, uh, uh, this one from this triangle, so this is uh, perpendicular. So that gives you r sine phi sine theta, uh, sine theta here. Okay, that is your uh, y coordinate and the height is that from the that is r cosine pi here. So the that's how the polar coordinate system and the Cartesian coordinate systems are related. X equals r sine pi cosine theta, y equals r sine pi sine theta, and that equals r cosine theta. So for example, if you want to find a volume, volume of a three-dimensional uh, region or the solid, uh, it's sometimes easier to use a spherical polar coordinate to calculate the volume. So if you do that, then the powers of x and y will then generate powers of sine theta and cosine theta because of this relationship here, right? So the integrals over powers of x and y will generate integrals with powers of trick function. So this is the reason we want to focus on uh, integration of trick functions, right? For example, uh, here uh, you will come across if you are studying physics, uh, there are examples uh, in physics, volume calculation, chart distribution, acoustic vibrations, angular momentum of electrons, trajectories of falling space junk. They, they can be described and calculated uh, using spherical polar coordinate system, okay? Uh, so there, uh, when you, uh, for example, uh, if you calculate the volume and so on, you will end up uh, uh, working with integrals of product of trigonometric functions. Which is x is given a product of trig functions here, so it will generate powers of trig functions. Anyway, this is just a motivation for studying uh, uh, integration of trig functions. Okay, so. Uh, now we want to uh, start looking at uh, integration of trig functions. For example, you have uh, seen and used uh, integrals, uh, basic uh, the, uh, for the table of integrals, for example, and you have you would have used in high school calculus and also uh, math one one three one in term one as well, right? This this are just here 
put up that uh, uh, basic uh, integration formulas given on the table of uh, integrals. I'm not going to go through that. I'm sure you are very much familiar with this. You know, the integrals of simple functions like um, equal sine, equal cosine, exponential function, and so on. Um, now, what we want to do, uh, we, we would like to, I just want to give you a, a, a quick review of integration techniques. Uh, even though you would have seen it, you may have forgotten about those techniques. Just to refresh your memory on those things, I'm going to go through uh, some examples as a review. Here are the, I have summarized them in this slide here. Let me go through that one by one, slowly. So let's look at the first one here. So these uh, uh, techniques actually will help uh, finding integrals of uh, difficult uh, uh, functions and so on. So look at the first one here, A. So if you have a integral uh, like this, uh, uh, involving 2x minus 9 over square root of x squared minus 9x plus 1, right? This is not exactly on the uh, table of integrals. Now, what we want to do, we want to convert this into one of those types um, which is available in, in the table of uh, integrals, right? Now, if you look at the, uh, the expression inside the square root, right? That's x squared minus 9x plus 1. When you differentiate that, you get 2x minus 9. So 2x minus 9 is on the top here. So therefore, you can use a substitution, say, u equals uh, 2x squared minus 9x plus 1. When you differentiate it, uh, uh, du will appear on top. So that becomes du over square root of u. So that, that means u to the minus half over du. You can write down the answer from the table of integrals. Pretty easy. So sometimes we have to use simple substitution. Now look at the part b here. Now, in the table of integrals, you have formulas like integral a, integrals involved with square root of a squared minus x squared, uh, and so on. So here, but this is not exactly of that form. So what we can do here, we can uh, complete the square and then convert it into a form a squared minus x squared. Now, if you look at this x minus 4 squared, which is x squared minus 8x plus 16, that's minus 16 here. So that cancels out, you get 8x minus x squared. So by completing the square, you can write a square root of 8x, squared, 8x minus x squared as square root of 16 minus x minus 4 squared. So that means this is of the form 16 that's 4 squared minus x minus 4 squared. Right? So now you can put a simple substitution x minus 4 is big x. So this is of the form uh, square root of 4 squared minus x squared. That's for a squared minus x squared. You can read off the integral from the basic uh, table of integrals. Okay? This is the second technique uh, we use. Look at the third one, part C here. Sometimes we have to use trigonometric identity uh, to simplify the integral. So, for example, the integral involves 6 plus tan x squared. So, it's not exactly on the uh, a table of uh, integrals there. So what we can do, uh, square it, expand it, this was 6 squared x plus 2 tan x, x, uh, sec x plus tan squared x, right? So we know that uh, uh, 6 squared x, you can use the table of integral. You can also use sec x tan x from the table of integral because ddx of tan x is 6 squared, ddx of sec x is sec x tan x, right? So one thing is tan squared x, we need to uh, 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 convert that into a, a, another form because if you use the identity is x squared equals 1 plus tan squared x, right? Use the identity is x squared equals 1 plus tan squared x, then you can write tan squared x as x squared x minus 1 here. Okay? Now you uh, now simplify this. You get x squared x, uh, 1 x squared x, there 2 x squared x, 2 sec x tan x minus 1. So this now you can easily uh, integrate using the uh, using the table of integrals, right? So sometimes we may have to use the trigonometric identities. Let's let's look at the part D. Here, the square root of one plus uh, cosine four x. 
it's a, it, it, it will be easier if you can get rid of the square root here. Now, how do you get rid of the square root? It's 1 plus cosine 4x. You can choose the half angle formula. So cosine 2 theta equals 2 cosine, uh, 2 cosine squared theta minus 1. So if you put, uh, if you, to convert the cosine 4x, you put here theta equals 2x, right? So that gives you cosine 4x equals 2 cosine squared 2x minus 1. So we can write this uh, 1 plus cosine 4x is 2 cosine squared 2x, right? So that gives you here. And then you take the square root, with root 2 squared cos absolute value cosine 2x. Then you can use the table of integrals uh, to evaluate the integrals. Okay, so again, here we are using an identity here. So the double angle formula is used to simplify. Now, the, another technique that uh, we often use uh, uh, part E here. So reducing an improper fraction into simple fraction. For example, we have 3x squared minus 7x over 3x plus 2. So we can write this into some of two uh, functions like that. How do you do that? Well, we want to di uh, divide 3x squared minus 7x by 3x plus 2. You can use the polynomial factorization or uh, long division uh, formula. Let me use the long division formula here, uh, algorithm. So 3x squared minus 7x. So you want to divide this by 3x plus 2, right? OK. So let's, let's apply the long division algorithm here. So that gives you uh, uh, x here. You get 3x squared uh, plus 2x. You subtract that, that gives you uh, 9x. And then to give this, uh, multiply this by, say, minus 3, so you get minus 9x, minus 6, subtract that, you get plus 6 there. So therefore, you can write the polynomial uh, here, 3x squared. Can you see this? Uh, yes. 3x squared uh, minus 7x equals... So that's the, uh, the, the 3x plus 2. The quotient is x minus, uh, x minus 3 times 3x plus 2. The remainder is 6, right? So now divide by uh, uh, x minus uh, 3x plus 2, you get x minus 3 plus. When you divide this, you will get this uh, formula there. So we can write the improper fraction into uh, a, a simple, in terms of a uh, simple fraction like this, x minus 3, x over 3x plus. Uh, this kind of technique will be useful later on when we integrate rational functions, polynomial over polynomial. We'll be looking at later on uh, next week. Now, the, the other technique we also use, let's look at part f, for example. Part f, separating, the, separating a fraction. So if you look at this, this integral here, and it's really involving the functions like 3x plus 2 over square root of 1 minus x squared, right? It is not exactly on the table of integrals. You can, you can split, split it up into two simple integrals. So we divide by square root of 1 minus x squared, 3x over square root of 1 minus x squared, and plus 2 over square root of 1 minus x squared. Now, this one you can easily integrate it because when you differentiate uh, the expression inside the square root, uh, square root, 1 minus x squared is minus 2x, so x dx is there. You can in in integrate that using substitution. So this is, this is of the right form. Uh, this is the form uh, you can write is uh, square root of uh, 1 squared minus x squared. It's on the form x squared minus x squared. So you can also use the table of integrals uh, to evaluate that. Okay? Uh, we will be using this kind of technique as well later on uh, in the integration. Uh, there. The last one is the uh, part G. Sometimes we uh, use, we have to multiply the uh, multiplier form by one. It's a trick uh, sometimes used. For example, in the integral of sec x, if you want to find the integral of sec x, you write sec x, sec x times one. You multiply top and bottom by sec x plus tan x, uh, sec x plus tan x. So that is the reason is when you multiply this out, on the, on the denominator, you get sec x plus tan x. Now, if you look at the expression of the numerator there, which is uh, multiply this out, 6 squared x plus sec x tan x, right? So 
if you let this uh, denominator uh, as do when differentiate that the derivative appears on the top so this is of the form du over u uh, du so that you can easily integrate so these are the main techniques uh, which we, you need to be familiar with to do the integration now if you can do integration with a the the calculus form will be much easier because all the differential equation and so on uh, can be done easily if you can do the integration better no uh, no you don't you don't need to remember them but as we go along you will see that we will be applying this these techniques so th then you will you should be able to do it okay so these so are that i have basically summarized the the main techniques involved in these ones okay so now we are ready to tackle uh, integration involving trick functions uh, we can use those techniques as well let's start with the first one we look at various uh, types yes that's right uh, we can also use the tables and maple, maple as well all right let's start with the uh, simple example uh integral of cosine cube x sine squared x uh, how, see how we can integrate this so so if you if you look at that this is an odd power of cosine and then, then you have an even power here so what we can do you can factor out one cosine x from this odd power okay let's write you separate that so i can write this as cosine squared x sine squared sine squared x and then factor out cosine x here you factor cosine x uh all right now so now we can so if you put for example uh, u equals sine x right then when you differentiate it you get cosine x dx so you you have here cosine x dx so if you use a substitution u equals uh, sine x uh, this will simplify okay so so put u equals uh, so th uh, then you need to rewrite the integrals in terms of uh, a sine x right so you can use the identity right using the identity you can write cosine squared x sine squared x equals 1 you can write this cosine squared x is uh, 1 minus sine squared x okay times sine squared x times cosine x dx okay now you can rewrite it in terms of the uh, substitution u variable u here so that is u uh, 1 minus u equals sine x 1 minus u squared times u squared and cosine x dx is just simply du so this is a simple integration of polynomial so you multiply this side so that gives you integral u squared minus u to the power 4 du you can integrate term by term so that gives you uh, u keep on 3 minus u to the power 5 1 5 plus constant of integration c now substitute uh, for uh, u, u equals sine x, so that gives you sine cube x over 3 minus sine to the power 5 x over 5 plus c. So that gives you the integral of this cosine cube x. So let me ask you, why did I factor out cosine x uh, uh, from this odd power rather than factor out sine x from sine squared x? The reason is, if I factor out one cosine x here, you have an even power here, cosine squared. Therefore, you can use the identity. That's right, exactly. Yeah, Michael, you're right. So if you factor out sine x, it's not good because you are left with sine x. That's not good. You cannot use the identity. OK, so, so we can apply the similar techniques in general as well. Uh, so let me uh, give you extend this idea uh, we will look at the techniques later on as well. Yes, how to convert them into a double angle formula. Okay, so in general, you can 
in the universe of the form uh, cosine mx sine and x. Now, at least one of m o n is out. We can we can apply this uh, technique to factor out one uh, uh, cosine or sine, depending on which one is out, right? So let's look at another example here. Cosine uh, to the power four x and sine cube x. Okay, you have the uh, here m is even four, and here n is out. Now you can factor out uh, sine x from here. Okay, you can factor out, so let me write it again here, cosine 4x sine cube x dx. So you have what power there? So I, I factor out one sine x, so you uh, left it here sine squared x and sine x uh, dx. So that factor here. Okay, so now you can use the substitution u equals cosine x, then you, you can uh, simplify it. So if you could say let uh, u equals uh, cosine x, then when you differentiate it, you have minus sine x dx there. So you have sine x dx can be written there. Now if you want to use the substitution, you're going to write everything uh, everything in terms of uh, cosine x, right? Okay, so that gives you uh, cosine to the power 4x, uh, you, that is there, and you can write sine squared x using the identity, which is 1 minus cosine squared x times sine x dx. So now it is in the right form. Sub into uh, 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 u for cosine x, you will get here uh, u to the power 4, 1 minus u squared. And this was sine x dx is minus u. OK? So uh, take the minus sign, you multiply this u to the power 4 minus uh, u to the power 6, they use a simple integration of polynomial in two. So that gives you here u to the power 515 from the table, u to the power 7 and 7 plus a uh, constraint of integration. So sub substitute back for uh, u, so that gives you cosine to the power 5x on 5 plus cosine to the power 7x on 7 plus constant. So this idea, you substitute for, uh, no, 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 yeah. you got to simplify into get to this form. If I use a substitution, u equals cosine x, and then you're going to try and write everything in terms of uh, uh, cosine x to do that. Okay? So this idea will work in general if we have uh, one of M O N is odd. Okay, so so that is actually given in the next slide as a general uh, formula. So if you have integral of this type, integral as uh, cosine M X times sine in X, right? So look for an odd power, right? Look for an odd power. Say if M is an odd power. Uh, a part, in fact, of cosine x, as I did in the previous example, and then put u equals sine x and the du equals cosine x dx, then the whole expression can be written in terms of uh, remaining factors of cosine m minus 1 x dx as an even power of m minus 1. This is done using the identity sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1, okay, to eliminate even powers. And then uh, you end up with this uh, simple. Um, integral involving uh, polynomials. Uh, it can be easily integrated term by term. Uh, okay. Uh, if, uh, if, if any sort, you, you can factor out sine x, as we did for the cosine. Right? If it's any sort, you can factor out one sine and, uh, and then using the identity and to convert that into a simple form of polynomial. So that's how this uh, method uh, works. What about if you have uh, even powers? So that's the next one uh, we want to look at, second type. We'll consider cosine to the power mx times sine to the power nx. Both m and n are even this time. Both m and n are even. So for example, so let's look at this uh, simple example here. Integral sine squared x times cosine squared x dx. Now here, we, we, we can use the, the double angle formula 
or you can call a half angle formula to rewrite the integral. Okay, uh, someone pointed that out before. Uh, so we, remember that um, uh, the half angle formula cosine squared x is 1 plus cosine 2x and 2, and sine squared x is 1 minus cosine 2x and 2. So, so let's uh, you can do it in, uh, two ways here. Let's use this uh, uh, half angle formula with cosine x first, right? So let's write this integral uh, sine squared x times cosine squared x dx. Okay, so sine squared x is 1 minus cosine 2x on 2. So 1 minus cosine 2x on 2. And cosine squared x is 1 plus cosine 2x on 2. Okay, dx. Multiply this out, so that gives you the factor out of one for the denominator. That, that gives you one minus cosine squared two x. A minus b times a plus b a squared minus b squared. Right? So, so this then is uh, integral uh, one fourth dx minus one fourth cosine squared two x dx. And again here. Again, here you have the uh, even power. You can apply the uh, half angle formula again. Okay, so cosine squared uh, 2x equals so that. This one is uh, x over 4 minus 1 4. So integral cosine squared x uh, 2x uh, equals 1 plus cosine 4x on 2. Yeah, from using the double angle uh, formula. Okay, so so I'm using, for example, let me write it how I got this one. Cosine squared theta equals 1 plus cosine 2 theta on 2. That's the formula, right? Put theta equals uh, 2x. Then you will get this formula here. Put theta equals 2x, cosine squared, uh, uh, cosine squared 2x equals 1 plus cosine 4x on 2. So that's how I got this one here. Okay. Um, so now we can easily integrate this one. X over one four. Uh, so that's one on eight times uh, one plus cosine four x dx. So that gives you X over four. So that one as uh, integral dx over Eight and this one minus again uh, one on eight cosine four x dx. Oops. Okay, so that gives you x on four. Uh, that's uh, x on eight. That one minus one on uh, eight cosine four x sine four x on four plus c consider integration. So that gives you minus uh, uh, here x on eight minus uh, one hundred thirty-two sine four x on four. Now this one way of uh, uh, using it. Yes, you are right. I'm going to uh, I'm going to use that uh, formula as well, Michael. So you can also use the double angle formula for sine as well. Let, let's do that. Actually, it turns out that will be easier here, and you will see the reason why I use that cosine formula first later on. Okay, let's try. I'm going to redo this uh, this example again. So let's consider again. Uh, integral uh, sine squared x cosine squared x dx. Uh, I equals here. Now this time I'm going to use the double angle formula for sine, right? You know that sine 2x, 2 sine x, cosine x, right? So therefore you can write sine x, cosine x, sine 2x and 2, all right? So that gives you sine x, this one is uh, sine x, cosine x squared, dx. So I write this, sine x, cosine x is sine 2x on 2 squared, dx. All right, so that gives you one fourth uh, sine squared two uh, x dx. We can apply the half angle formula as we did before. Uh, 
Uh, this one is n squared x is uh, 1 minus cosine 4x on 2. If you apply this formula, get equals uh, 2x, you get 1 minus cosine 4x on 2. So that gives you 1 on 8, uh, 1 minus cosine 4x. So that's a, a simple integral uh, to deal with that. So that is uh, x over 8 minus integral cosine 4x 1 on 8 dx is uh, sine 4x on 4 plus yeah, that's exactly the answer we got before. So this time uh, uh, using the double angle formula sine makes things easier. Uh, so 1 minus cosine then expand and integrate them term by term. Uh, Yes, here I have it's a sine square two x there, so therefore I have to use the uh, half angle formula here to do that. Uh, so depending on which one you find it easier. Uh, now I have first looked at the cosine formula. You'll see later on that that, that approach actually works for even more complicated function with even powers. Right? That's the reason I did that with. Uh, uh, integrate cosine cube x. Yes, that may need, uh, then you have to factor it out and so on. One cosine x. Okay, so this idea actually works in general uh, for even powers. So that's actually uh, given on the next slide. But you don't really need to use this as a, uh, you know, as a rule. But by looking at the form, you can find a simple way of uh, uh, transferring that into a simple uh, integral. Now, if, if both m and n are even, so m equals 2j, right, n equals 2k, the, both are even, then we, we can use this identity uh, identity cosine square is 1 plus cosine 2x and 2, as I did before, you get the powers of cosine, and sine square x is 1 minus 2x and 2, that's powers of k, and then you change the integral into sum of integrals of the form, uh, integral of cosine to the power, some power times 2x using the half angle formula. So that's what I have done in the past two examples. Okay? Uh, if there is out, then we can use the uh, first technique, you factor out one cosine term and then use the substitution. If j is even, then we use the same trick using the ha half angle formula. So that's how it is uh, done here. So let's do a, a, a past exam question of this chart. Let's see how we can do this. Uh, here's the final exam question we have given uh, recently. You are asked to evaluate sine cube theta cosine to the power phi theta. So look, look at the integral uh, closely here. So you have both our parts here. You have. Uh, sine cube theta and cosine phi theta. So you have two options here. So let's uh, uh, do this, sine cube theta, cosine to the power phi theta. You can factor out, so let's say uh, I factor out cosine here from here. So I factor out one cosine, sine cube theta, and then you have cosine uh, four theta, and then factor out one cosine theta here. So that's the factor. Okay, so now that means I'm going to use a substitution u equals sine theta, right? So that that tells you you have to write everything in terms of sine. So you have an even power that so you can write in terms of sine. Okay, so that gives you integral sine cube theta. This is cosine square theta, so that is one minus sine square theta, or two. Right, cosine square theta is one uh, one minus sine square theta, and then you have cosine theta d theta. Now you uh, use a substitution, put u equals sine theta, and you can write everything in terms of uh, sine. So then du equals uh, uh, cosine theta d theta. So let's let's write uh, in terms of the variable u. That is u q times 1 minus u squared to the power 2. So this one is simply du. 
okay so now we need to uh, integrate this uh, uh, polynomial so let's uh, expand this u cube 1 minus u squared to the power 2 so 1 minus 2 u squared plus u to the power 4 du okay so multiply by u cube uh, you get u cube minus 2 u to the 5 and u seven du now you can integrate term by term ec that gives you uh, u to the power uh, 4 on 4 minus 2 u to the power 6 on uh, 6. Look for which part we should expand and the factor. Yes, that's right. So that's the, you will learn by doing various examples which one is easier. Uh, plus u to the 8 over 8 plus a considerable integration. So then you substitute back for um, uh, two, so u equals sine theta, sine to the four theta on four, uh, minus one third uh, sine to the six theta, plus sine eight theta over eight uh, plus six. That's easy. Now, you are right, you uh, uh, are You can also factor out um, uh, one sine as well. That will also work. And then Use the substitution u equals cosine theta. But you end up with the same answer. Okay? Dep depends on which one is, um, looks easier uh, to you. All right, so that's how we uh, solve product of uh, uh, trigonometric function. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Now, what about uh, multiple angular integration? Uh, so let's look at the multiple angle integration. Now these are done, so these are integral of this form, sine n x times cosine n max. So say n, n equals 2, m equals 3, you have integral of the type sine 2x times cosine 3x, or uh, sine 2x times and, and sine 3x and so on. So these are done using the so-called product to sum formula. Remember the product to sum formula? Here I've written down here. You can write sine A, sine B. Sine A cosine B is half cosine A plus B plus half sine A minus B. And sine A sine B is uh, cosine A minus B minus cosine A plus B. You may you better note that when you have a product of sine, you have a minus sign here. Cosine A minus B minus cosine A plus B. Cosine A cosine B, you can write in terms of sum. Cosine A minus B plus cosine A plus B. So we can use this. Uh, um, Product to some formula to integrate uh, multiple angle uh, trigonometric functions. So let's do an example of this type. Okay. Uh, sine 3x and sine 2x dx. Simple one. So that you have a multiple angle uh, integration, uh, product of both a sine function. The product of sine function, we used that formula previously, the second one I Highlighted there, sine A sine B equals cosine half cosine A minus B minus cosine A plus B when you have product of sine, right? So here, uh, A equals, so that is your uh, A, A equals 3x and B equals uh, 2x. Okay, so you can write using the uh, integral, using the identity sine 3x times sine 2x dx equals integral half uh, cosine a minus b, uh, a is 3x and b is 2x, 3x minus 2x minus cosine a plus b, 3x plus 2x. Correct application, dx. Okay, so that gives you uh, not really, no. Uh, you should remember the product to uh, some formula. So that gives you uh, simply uh, cosine uh, x minus cosine 5x dx. Simple integration. You can use um, uh, term by term, half integral cosine x dx minus half integral cosine 5x dx. Okay, so that we can use the uh, table. Uh, 
sine x minus half uh, sine 5x on 5 plus extent of integration c. Well, if you, if you don't remember that, you have to, I think you should remember the sum formula, then you can derive them from the, using the sum formula. Um, okay, so this is how uh, we uh, integrate uh, product of uh, integration, uh, integral of trigonometric function with multiple angle, uh, uh, sine and cosine. Now, what about sec and tan? It's easier to deal with uh, uh, product of sine and cosine. Let's quickly look at some examples on um, a sex squared uh, tan uh, functions. So let's have a look at the first one here, see how we can do. So the idea is the same. How can we tell which formula to use? Um, well, depending on the, the product. If you have a product of two sine, then you need to use the formula cosine difference of cosine, cosine a minus b minus cosine a plus b. If you have sine and cosine, you should use that corresponding formula. Sine and cosine, you use uh, uh, some of the sine, sine a plus b plus sine a minus b and so on. So you learn it by looking at various problems, the tutorial questions and so on. Okay, let's do a couple of examples on um, using a similar technique, uh, second term. So the first one here, integral, uh, six squared x tan x dx. Uh, so remember uh, uh, when you differentiate uh, tan x, maybe I'll write down here, note. Six squared x, dx of six x, you have six x tan x. That will be uh, useful here. Okay. Uh, here, uh, six squared x tan x, so using this dda tan, uh, when you differentiate tan x, you get six squared x, right? Okay, so you can, that tells you you can use substitution, put u equals uh, tan x, right? Then when you differentiate this, du equals uh, six squared x dx. So you have six squared x dx there, you can, if you like, you can write it in this form, six squared x dx. If I uh, rewrite it like that, if you put u equals tan x, so that becomes u times, that is du. Uh, simply, so you get uh, a simple integral, uh, u squared over 2 plus c, uh, constant, and substitute for u, so that's tan squared x over uh, 2 plus c. By the way, you can check your answer as well, whether it's right or wrong. When you differentiate the, your answer, you should get the integral back again as well. It's worth knowing that. So look at the second one. The idea is the same uh, as before. Uh, let's look at the second one here. Integral uh, sec cube x tan x dx. So what do we do here in this example? Can someone suggest what we can uh, uh, do here to integrate this? Remember that dx of sec x is sec x tan x, right? So if you factor out, right, if you factor out, yes, you're right, sec x tan x, then you can do, so I keep here sec squared x and factor out what? One sec x tan x dx. So you have that. And then you can use easy substitution. Uh, put u equals, this time, sec x here, right? Then, du equals sec x tan x dx, that's there. So that becomes, after substitution, uh, you get u squared times du. Okay, so that's simple. You keep on three plus constant of integration. So that gives you u equals sec, sec cube x over three plus constant. So the idea is the same. We, we just uh, uh, use this uh, differentiation rule, you know, uh, which can be used, well, you can be used to simplify. We want to do slightly complicated, but this is slightly, uh, this is slightly easier example. And uh, we may have to use sometime identities involving second term as well. 
So I'm going to do an example of that type uh, here. Have a look at this example here. Sex squared x times tan squared x times sex to the power four x. Now here uh, you can more than even powers here. Okay, so you can factor out sex squared x uh, from here. So that gives you tan squared x, sex squared x times sex squared x dx. Okay, so that gives you if you put uh, u equals uh, tan x, right? Then, when you differentiate this, du equals sex squared x dx. So that is there. But then you need to write the remaining integral in terms of tan x because that's the substitution we are uh, using, right? So remember the identity? Using the identity sex squared x equals 1 plus tan squared x. So if you use that, uh, you can write uh, uh, tan squared x, sex squared x becomes 1 plus tan squared x, and then sex squared x dx. Now the substitution uh, will work uh, well here. So u equals tan x, substitute it in, u squared plus 1 plus u squared, uh, sex squared dx becomes du, we get a simple polynomial integration. So that gives you u squared, plus u to the power of 4, du, uh, you integrate term by term, uh, integral u squared du, plus integral u to the power of 4, du, so that gives you u cube on 3, plus uh, u to the power of 5, 1, 5, and plus constant of integration. And then you substitute back for u, that is uh, tan cube x over 3, uh, plus five x over five plus c. So that's how uh, we do that. So he, again, here we are used. To, we have used the identity here. In the previous uh, examples on product of sine and cosine and their powers, we use the identity sine squared uh, identity sine squared plus cosine squared is equals one. Uh, sec s u. Now, if you use sec, sec s u, then you get sec x tan x there, right? And uh, sometimes it looks, sometimes it may not, depending on the expression you have, and then the use of the identity as well. Okay, we may, I don't know, I have another example uh, to use your idea, maybe. So, I have a second example here. It's a little bit trickier, this one. Uh, have a look at this uh, uh, integral tan cube x times x cube x here. We have both odd powers, okay? Uh, show the fraction involving sine and cosine for sine. Sine, cosine again. Oh, okay, I, I, can, uh, I can bring it back. Yes, just a second. Okay, let me go back. You mean the multiple angle formula, right? So this one here. Is that what uh, Eric, you are asking? This one? Yeah, okay. So if you have the integral involving multiple angle of sine and cosine, so you have three types here product of sine and cosine, and product of sine and sine, and also cosine and cosine. So in this case, you see that three formulas here. If you have the integral involving product of sine and cosine, the first type, you use this uh, product to some formula uh, half cosine a plus b plus sine a minus b, right? For this, the first one here. The first one, you can use this. Now, the second one, uh, uh, both the product of uh, sine function, okay, so that's true. You can use this. That is sine a sine b, half cosine a minus b minus cos cosine a. That's what we did in the previous example as well. Now, if you have the product of uh, cosine function, cosine x and cosine mx here, you can use. That's the product of cosine. You can use this formula here. One half cosine a minus b plus cosine a plus b. Okay? Uh, you got that? Good. All right. So that's a, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I think that's enough for today. Uh, but let me also point out one thing here. Uh, last slide. Uh, 
Now there are there are rules uh, I have given in the, in the outline lecture notes for the product of uh, powers of sec and tan, but you don't worry about the details of this rule. You you simply look for uh, something obvious uh, uh, and easy. For example, you can use sec squared equals one plus tan squared x or ddx tan x is sec squared or ddx of sec x is tan x. Just use these ideas. Uh, to simplify the integral. Don't worry about the, the rules given for general powers m and n, right? So as we have done in the exam. Okay, so that's how we deal with uh, uh, cryptometric uh, uh, integration. Uh, next lecture, I will talk about um, reduction formula. That's an interesting one. Uh, we use the reduction formula to find simple integration. Uh, and after that, we will look at the integ integration of rational function and so on. So I will uh, stop with this now. Now, let me also say, I will hang around here for five minutes after the lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me as well. Uh, actually, yeah, you're right. This is a part of the, uh, you would have seen even three unit as well, and four unit HSC. Yeah. Okay. So that's all for today. Uh, thank you. See you next next week.